Welcome everyone, good morning. My name is Alexander San Miguel. I am the design team lead of Venturi Industries. Today we will be discussing the preliminary design and its supporting evidence of our aircraft, the Venturi Kingfisher. I am joined today by my chief engineer, Veronica Norkis, as well as Zane Zalstra, Yoav Zimron, Lance Mitchell, Corey Blythe, Jason Fung, Preston Vargeco, Trace Sheeran, and Cole Macklin. Right here is a quick overview of what we'll be discussing today. We'll first off start with the business need, go into the design details of our aircraft, and then finally open the floor to any questions you may have. Let's go ahead and start with the business need for our aircraft. The Venturi Kingfisher is a backpackable, modular, unmanned aerial vehicle that provides leverage to ground personnel as well as ground infantry without sacrificing portability and mobility of the operator. It provides operator safety by allowing access to aerial surveillance as well as aerial munition capabilities. And we were able to achieve this at a very accessible cost compared to similar aircraft, which we'll discuss at the moment. On the screen, we have the AeroVironment Switchblade, as well as the Raytheon Coyote. These are classified as lethal miniature aerial munition systems, and they are designed to seek and destroy non-line-of-sight insurgents uh, for use with ground personnel. Now, as you can see, uh, the unit cost is 70,000 and 15,000 for the Switchblade and Coyote respectively. And these aircraft require more, uh, two or more personnel to operate and transport. On the screen here is our aircraft, the Venturi Kingfisher, at a much more competitive unit cost and also providing the same capabilities with the requirement of only one operator to both transport and fly the vehicle. Here is the three view of our aircraft so you can get a better picture of what uh, this looks like and its design configurations. We will be discussing that throughout the presentation. I'll now hand this over to Veronica Norkis to discuss our mission and aircraft description. Okay, so as with every project, we have requirements. Just some of our few main requirements is that our aircraft must be able to carry a payload of three pounds. Along with that, the entire system must fit within a 45 liter backpack and not weigh more than 30 pounds. Also, the aircraft must be deployable in 60 seconds after it is taken out of the backpack. Another big requirement is cost. The entire cost for building our aircraft must not exceed $2,500. So to pass it over to Trace here to talk about our concept of operations. Alrighty, so I'm going to be going over the concepts of operations, the CONOPS. So the idea is for the requirements was it's a single operator, right? So the single operator with the backpack, the drone inside, would then take the drone out, place the uh, drone on the ground once it's assembled, and from there now has the capability to launch the drone vertical takeoff. From there, the drone will climb. Once it has reached its cruising altitude, it will cruise to the specified target area. Now with our range and our endurance, we'll have the capability to lawyer over any target airspace or any place where we uh, deem it necessary so that you can assess the target area. You don't want to have any civilian casualties. You want to make sure that you can assess what's going on beneath you because at this day and age, that's kind of a huge focus, especially with military munitions. Once the target's been assessed and it's a shoot, no shoot, and you decide that it's time to shoot and head down, the drone will then descend um, to the target area and eliminate the target. I will now hand it off to Cole Macklin to discuss the assembly methods. So I'm just going to give a brief overview of how our plane quickly assembles for more detail in later slides. Um, currently our two wings slide together, um, and our back one is the same way except our vertical tail fins slide into that. Um, from there they clip directly onto the top and bottom of our plane, and then sit vertically for our takeoff. Um, I'm going to hand this off to you. So over here we can see the entire mission profile of the Venturi Kingfisher. So the first thing we have to do is the vertical takeoff. That's designed to get us to just a little bit above our stall speed of 22 knots. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, 
that's going to take us about six seconds. Uh, the next step would be a transition to a forward flight and continuing our climb to 500 ATL. We're going to do that at uh, 500 foot per minute and 45 knots per speed. It's going to take us a little less uh, than a minute and a little less than a mile. Uh, the next step is our six mile cruise. We're going to be cruising at 50 knots to airspeed and 500 AGL for six miles. It's going to take us uh, a little less than, uh, than six minutes. Uh, the next optional step is our loiter. If, uh, if we need to loiter above the target and assess the situation and see if there's any non-combatants involved, we can do that with our loiter. Again, we're still at 500 AGL, 50 knots in a 500 foot radius. And it, uh, our mission profile is concluded with our last step, which is the dive to target. We're going to be diving at negative 1,000 foot per minute and, uh, and 50 knots. We're going to end this off to Zane Zalstra for the wing side. Thank you, Yellow. So we chose the tandem wing configuration due to its unique advantages that help us satisfy the RFP requirements as well as the size constraints of our airplane. So the definition, by definition, that a tandem wing aircraft, uh, both the front and rear, rear wings contribute to lift. Uh, this means that we can decrease the overall span of uh, those individual wings. That helps us fit inside the backpack. Um, as compared to a traditional one wing, uh, single wing aircraft, uh, in the same span, a tandem wing will uh, have a higher overall coefficient of lift. Um, also, because there's two wings to spread the uh, wing loading, uh, we can decrease the structure weight inside those uh, wings. Uh, and the combination of the decreased structure weight and the uh, decreased span will lead uh, to a higher, more, more maneuverable aircraft um, that can fit inside a smaller form factor. These were the largest uh, design considerations for the wing. There's also inherent disadvantages with tandem wings. Um, for example, uh, tandem wings are very sensitive to small shifts in the center of gravity. However, we're mitigating this uh, because uh, we have a fixed payload and we have a battery powered airplane. So that CG does not shift mid flight at all. Um, also, the rear, rear wing can face uh, washout and downwash effects um, at certain angles of attack. Um, so it's very important to, uh, to place those wings very carefully. Um, we place the wings so they have the least interference during cruise and fly. Uh, with preliminary uh, CFD modeling in x 5 uh, we found that the rear wing doesn't face uh, interference until negative uh, 15 or, or negative 10 to negative 15 degrees angle of attack. Uh, so we will ensure that we tell the pilots of this aircraft um, to not fly in that regime. This is, a, uh, this is an overall wing layout um, with some important parameters for our aircraft. As you can see, uh, the half span of each of those wing sections is only 21 inches, and the core is, uh, is six inches. So that means that we can easily fit inside that 45 liter backpack. Uh, another important thing is uh, we have a one degree incident on the front wing. Um, that means that uh, we did that because we want the front wing to stall first um, and that rear wing will still be providing lift. So that'll lead to a nose down pitching moment uh, and the aircraft will be able to uh, recover itself. Easily. This is important because we want, the, um, we want the aircraft to be fairly easy to fly uh, with relatively inexperienced pilots. Uh, we selected the SG6043 for both the front and the rear wings. Um, all the, those characteristics uh, you, see, you see on the board are the reasons why. Um, big ones were high uh, lift to drag ratio, uh, gentle stall characteristics, and uh, ease of fabrication. This is our 2D versus 3D lift curve for uh, our airfoil. Um, I think you can see that in blue. Um, and in yellow is a single wing uh, lift curve, 3D lift curve. Um, but when you take into consideration the lift of the entire aircraft with that rear wing, um, that shifts the entire curve up, uh, and we're able to get a, a ma our predicted max coefficient of lift of 2.22. Um, we were able to uh, model this in x 5 as well, and uh, that uh, lift curve slope was um, verified, and that gave us confidence in our empirical methods. 
So using the uh, drag buildup technique, uh, we were able to um, we were able to get an overall co sorry we were able to get a overall parasitic drag coefficient of 0.046. This was taking into consideration the uh, wetted areas of each main component on the airplane. And on the left, you can see our total aircraft drag folder uh, at max cruise altitude at cruise. I'm going to hand this off to Lance Mitchell. So our nose cone will be 3D printed with ABS plastic because it has a unique shape that would otherwise be difficult to manufacture. The fuselage will be a square, and the camera lens located on the front tip of the aircraft will be circular. So in the span of three inches, the nose cone will have to transition from a square base to a circular lens hole cavity. Now the camera lens hole and the camera itself will be going to 10 degrees down based off of prior aircraft designs. This angle is optimal for the pilot to be able to tell where the aircraft is flying and be able to track potential ground targets below. There's some performance predictions calculated for cruise velocity at minimum altitude, maximum altitude, and Prescott altitude, since the UAV will be flying here next semester. The aircraft produces a max drag of 1.67 pounds and a max velocity at stall of 25 knots. This will be overcome by 12 pounds of lift and a thrust to weight ratio of 1.4. Now if you look below, you can see the endurance parameter and max lift to drag parameters. The lift to drag parameter occurs in cruise at zero degrees angle of attack and has a value of 10.2. We use these to calculate our max range of 10.7 miles and our loitered endurance of 10.7 minutes. We also have a wing loading at cruise of 3.43 pounds per square foot. So to summarize, the wings will be small enough when the aircraft is fully disassembled, the entire aircraft will fit inside a 45 liter backpack. The wings will also be able to produce and exceed our maximum and minimum range and altitude. I will now hand this off to Corey Blythe and Jason Plum to discuss structural size. Okay. Thank you, Lance. So as you can see up here, this is a dimension drawing of our wing. There are two spars per wing made of carbon fiber, and there are six ribs per half span uh, for every single uh, half wing. Uh, the ribs are made of ABS plastic, and in terms of the ABS plastic and the carbon fiber, this allows for an easier uh, manufacturing. So firstly, the user has to connect the half spans together with a pair of connecting spars located at the ends of the root ribs for each half span. Simply slice them together creates a full wing. Uh, this allows for an easier assembly and also allows for rapid deployment. All right, Jason Fung will now talk about the wing loading. <coughs> All right, so in order to find the internal stresses within our wing structure, we uh, employed Schrunk's approximation to determine the uh, actual load of the wing. Uh, for our calculations, we assumed the aircraft was performing its max G-turn of 2.5 Gs. And with this, we found the maximum bending moment to be about 90.7 pound inches uh, at the center of the wing right here where that arrow is pointing uh, with the connecting spars. Um, since our wing structure is <coughs> carbon fiber and ABS plastic, uh, ABS plastic is weaker, so that was a limiting factor with uh, our amount of stress allowed. So with that, ABS plastic has a, an average maximum bending strength of about 10,000 PSI. Um, using 3D uh, stress calculations, uh, bending calculations, we found the uh, stress to be about 1,764 PSI. Gave us a really large uh, margin of safety of about 4.6. Um, we also determined the uh, angle of twist at the uh, wing tips to be about 3.6 uh, degrees. Corey. Thank you. So after the full wing has been assembled, it now has to be attached to the fuselage. So in spirit, in spirit of rapid deployment, uh, the root ribs uh, have a connector plate located uh, beneath them, and all the user really has to do is insert it into the fuselage and then press down as a connector plate. Mm -hmm. Jason will talk about the structural properties surrounding that. 
Um, so what the clip being made out of ABS, uh, it was really important that we knew, uh, knew what the maximum stress in this clip was. So uh, we found that by uh, finding the internal bending moments throughout the entire clip. Uh, and we found that the maximum uh, bending moments or uh, maximum stress would be in these two locations right here, these two your small cross-sectional area. Um, with that, we determined that the max uh, bending moment due to the actual lift uh, generated by the wings would be about 6.7 pound inches. Uh, on top of that, we also have an aileron uh, moment about 0.5 pound inches, obviously when the aerons are uh, actuating and uh, producing a moment to roll the aircraft. Um, so with that, we still have the same 10,000 PSI uh, limit, um, and we determined that the uh, bending stress in these two areas uh, came out to about 7,655, their current dimensions. They gave us an emergency safety about 0.32. Um, with this, our wing structures do satisfy, or satisfy our requirements. Uh, since we're using ABS and carbon fiber, both lightweight materials, um, it should allow us to meet our 30 pound requirement. Um, due to the fact that everything is uh, set up so that everything connects and clips into the fuselage super easily, should be easy to deploy. And since the wing is uh, multiple parts, it's easy to restore as well. And due to the fact that we're using uh, 3D printed ABS, it should be easy to build. With this, with our fuselage, we decided to go with a square cross section due to the fact that um, square uh, fuselages are easier to build and as well as uh, allow the uh, wings to clip in super easily since it's just a flat surface to clip onto. Um, inside the fuselage, we'll have two bulkheads to uh, help support the fuselage as well as uh, hold over components in the fuselage. Uh, with this, they're about 10.9 inches apart. Uh, and we'll be using uh, pins to help uh, support the fuselage and the bulkheads. Um, with this, during our max sheet turn, we found that the pins will only take a load of about 30 pounds, um, which came out to about 120 PSI. Uh, these pins will be made out of ABS, so we have a large margin of safety with this, about 82. Um, with this, our fuselage, once again, easy deployable since it, be allow it allows us to use that clip system, just clip right in. Um, it's a square cross section, easy to store as well, and uh, easy to build. I'm going to hand it over to Preston to talk about the weight balance. Thank you, Jason. Okay, so today I'm just going to be briefly going over our aircraft CG profile view. Currently, our center of gravity for the aircraft is at 15.9 inches at a total weight of 12 pounds. This total weight includes our 3 pound payload as well. The main thing to point out is we will not be having a varying CG throughout flight due to the fact that uh, we are battery powered and there are also no passengers. Uh, so this would eliminate the need for an excursion plot as well. Uh, the 12 pound aircraft also allows 18 pounds of space to either, if the weight needs to change, or also include the rest of the system, which would include the controller and uh, different things to operate the aircraft. And now I'm gonna also hand this over to Trace Sheeran to talk about stability control. Thank you very much. All right, moving on to the stability of this aircraft. So the stability values, as of right now, all the ones that we're looking for are predicted to be stable. So that's both longitudinal and lateral. So our static margin is pretty good. Um, so this aircraft isn't gonna you know, pitch up into non-existence or try and kill itself on a pitch down as soon as you let it go. Um, along with that, the lateral, so your, your roll and your yaw stability, it's looking pretty good at the moment. Again, these are our predicted values with what we have to work with right now. We need to wait until uh, later till we have more data to truly make the, the real estimates that we need. But right now, the aircraft is looking really good. As you can see here, uh, our aerodynamic center is at 16.9 inches, and then our center of gravity is 15.9, so our AC is well behind our CG, giving us a pretty stable aircraft as of right now. So because of this stability, now we get to move on to like the ailerons. So the ailerons are placed at the wing tip of the main wing. Um, as was said earlier, the predicted roll moment is 0.5 pounds per inches. And as you can see here uh, from that historic graph over on your right, Kingfisher falls well within that limit of uh, historic aircraft. So this is a pretty good aileron just based on the ability to roll the aircraft um, and kind of just move it along in its ways. Elevator sizing. Elevators and ailerons are the same size. This is for ease of fabrication and redundancy. So you'd like to have redundancy when you're using these kind of things. If something goes wrong in one, you have a few more uh, systems to kind of take over. So the sizing is still the same, about seven inches. So the reason it's a little under seven is because this elevator and aileron are in between um, two of those ribs. And then two inch cord, uh, the 14.04 is from the center line of the aircraft. Um, again, the size limit for both of these control services is within the servo limits. 
Here's to talk about the uh, generated lift from the elevator. So of course, when you're pitching up, you want significant lift. So you want to be able to actually you know, move upwards when you're generating this lift. Um, with the elevators we have now, it's about a 50% uh, addition to the coefficient of lift that's already on that uh, horizontal tail. So how are we going to control these? Well, the control servos. So for the design currently, all of our servos are internal. So that means that the servos, the control rods, and the actuators are all inside the actual wing. So as you can see here from this picture, control rods rotate inside the control surface in a pocket cut out from the uh, leading edge of that control surface. So what we'll do with this is as the uh, servo rotates, it'll rotate a uh, control rod that moves inside and that torque is what uh, actually actuates up or down on the control surfaces. So to do this, we had to get a selection for this uh, servo, and we went with the SG92R micro servo. So it had to be small, thus the micro, to fit inside the wing because it's an internal body. Um, sufficient torque, so as you saw, the roll moment at least for the uh, for that aileron was 0.5 pounds per <coughs> pound inch. Our torque generated by this little guy is 14. So we have quite the amount of uh, roll to or torque to get what you need. Um, those other two. The operating speed has to do with the speed, so we want something that's a nimble. We want a nimble craft. If we're tracking moving targets, it's pretty intelligent to have something that can follow a moving target. People are pretty good at pivoting on axes. Um, as you can see there, here's some of the dimensions for the servo as well. All right, now we hand it off to Cole, and he's going to talk about the empennage sizing. All right, so the empennage or vertical tail fins, if you guys lock, are pretty big, as you noticed, and we do have two of them. That is to basically allow us to do a vertical takeoff. Um, the reason we're going with the vertical takeoff is we went over three different launch systems, all of which added weight and space to our backpack and complexity for setup time. This is a rapid deployable UAV, so we want to make sure that we're staying within that 60 second time limit. Uh, the, re the way this slides together is we have a attachment rail that slides into the back of both of our wings. We use a single pin system. That way in combat situations, we don't have somebody putting our uh, vertical tail upside down on one side and right side up on the other, just to kind of help uh, save that. We'll also be using a dry lubricant on this, like, such as graphite, so that in a combat situation, if there's dust and stuff flying around, we aren't getting that gum up and it's harder for our operator to put it in. Like I said, our wings are pretty big and we do not have rudders in them. The main reason we did not put rudders in them is to simplify them, um, but due to their size, we do have a lot of yaw stability. The other reason we didn't go with rudders on the backside was they do come in contact with the ground and we do not want any dust or other particulates uh, locking that up and causing issues during flight. Uh, again, our size is pretty big, so relative to conventional aircraft, our uh, volume coefficient is relatively large, but again, it needs to be that large in order to provide us stability during our launch. I will hand this off to Yoa. Alright, thank you very much. <clears throat> so the motor and propeller selection, as we have said, is a 60 size, 470 kV brushless electric motor. We're going to pair that with a folding carbon fiber 16 inches by 10 inches uh, propeller. That combination is going to give us a thrust to weight ratio with takeoff of uh, 1.4, which is exactly ideal for a uh, vertical takeoff. So this here shows our uh, power consumption for each of the onboard components. As you can see, the biggest consumers of power are the electronic speed control and the uh, motor, and the, the servos and all the FPP components, our first uh, first and gear components, are very minuscule compared to those. So this is the actual power that we're gonna need for every leg of our flight. And as you can see here, the vertical takeoff part is going to be the most uh, consuming part. In addition, uh, after our entire mission profile, which includes the vertical takeoff, the transition to forward flight, the cruise, three loiters, and uh, dive to target, we're expected to have 12.4% uh, energy left in the battery, so we have a little more uh, extra left if we, if we need it. So this here shows a uh, layout of our uh, onboard components. <coughs> so the, the main, uh, Powerhouse in this is our 7,000 milliamp hours 6-cell um, 22.2 LiPo battery. 
and then we have uh, two circuits, one on the bottom and one on the top. The bottom circuit is our control circuit. It's gonna be powering our motor and our receiver via the electronic speed controllers. The receiver is gonna be powering our four servos, two aileron and two elevator servos. Our second circuit is gonna be powering our FPV camera and transmitter. So we have a voltage regulator. We have to step down the voltage from uh, 22.2 to 16 volts. Then we have the FPV transmitter, which uh, both powers the FPV camera and also receives the video feed from the camera and sends it to our headset on the ground. So this is a more um, in-depth uh, wiring diagram. This is the actual wiring diagram we're gonna use when we're assembling everything. So as you can see, we have the FPV circuit on the bottom, the regulator, the transmitter and the camera, and then on the, on the top we have our electronic speed control, our brushless motor, and our receiver powering our four servos. So the FPV camera that we chose to go with is the FetchArc 960 TVL camera. The special thing about this camera is that unlike other FPV cameras, it actually records and transmits in a widescreen aspect ratio of 16.9. And uh, that wider, those few extra pixels that we're gonna get on the, on the sides are gonna help us a lot with uh, We've seen both what's in the air in front of us and uh, what's on the ground uh, right below us. So we have uh, two radio circuits on our plane. One is our control radio circuit, which is gonna be used to send uh, controls to the ailerons, the elevator, and the, uh, the motor. That is gonna be operating on a 2.4 gigahertz um, frequency spectrum. That's a pretty standard for, uh, for radio systems. On top of that, we're gonna have our FPV radio. So the antenna is gonna be broadcasting uh, live feed video all the time to our headset. And that is gonna be operating on a 5.8 gigahertz uh, spectrum. And uh, that was done intentionally to make sure that both radio systems can work at the same time uh, without interfering with each other. So when we decided where to mount the FPV camera, uh, we wanted to make sure we have uninterrupted uh, live video feed at all times. And for that reason, we decided to mount it at the bottom of the plane so that even when we're banking, uh, we still have direct line of sight between the FPV camera and our headset. I'll be handing this over to Veronica to talk about the project. So this is our upcoming master schedule for next semester. The main points of next semester will be testing, wind tunnel testing, testing of the control surfaces and testing of our propulsion system, and also at the end of the semester, bringing it all together and testing it as an entire aircraft. As with any program, there's always risks that can come up, so we came up with a risk and mitigation program. So one of our major risks is that our drag and lift calculations will be more than 30% off from our calculated values when we do wind tunnel testing next semester. We plan to mitigate this by using the wind tunnel testing and doing design iterations so we can come up with a value that would work for our aircraft. Since we are building next semester, another big problem we have is manufacturing quality control. To mitigate this problem, we, have, we, we will be designating a manufacturing lead to work with AXFAB for tolerances and specs of all of our products. This is a program um, cost summary. So labor to date cost, we have spent um, $111,215 and projected for next quarter is $140,000. So the overall cost of our program for labor is $255,000. Um, for our team hours, we predicted that we would be putting in 1,500 hours this semester, but we actually came under with um, 1,291 hours. Next semester that is predicted to go up just because we'll be building more and there will be a lot more design. So um, just a pie chart of how our hours were broken up. Most of them going to professional development, which is our class time and our meetings. And another obvious one is that engineering and technical. How our costs break down for how we are spending our money for our hours. Most of it going to engineering and technical because that is one of the most expensive pay rates. And here's our unit cost for the material. So as you can see, here's all the materials laid out per part and how much it will cost. There's a material subtotal of just about, just under $1,441. The cost per unit that we figured out, factoring in labor and materials for a 100 unit purchase is $4,000. And that leaves a 37.5% profit margin for us. 
for our program, we decided to go with a team website. The website is ran through Google, and in this we decided to go with this because there's no cost to the program, and you can easily access it through any mobile device or computer. It is easy for us to put up project specifics, master calendar, any data we have, and it's easy for the team to edit and add their own things so they can have their own personal space to share their information. I'm gonna hand this back to Alec for conclusions. Above are the key product parameters of the Mentory Kingfisher for your viewing convenience. And at the moment, we recommend that we proceed, or we are seeking approval to proceed with the aforementioned design configuration in order for us to uh, complete wind tunnel testing as well as fabrication. We will now open the floor to any questions that our panelists may have. I have a question. Yes, sir. First of all, I'd like to say you guys did a good job. Um, Thank you, our sir. Our question is in regards to the aerodynamics, stability of the vehicle. You mentioned putting a one degree incident on that forward wing. Certain forward wings have the same airfoil. You're doing that so the forward wing stalls first. Yes, sir. Have you considered looking at a different airfoil that stalls? Before the aft, before the aft wing, so that you're not putting that one degree incident, which could add to your uh, engine strike. That is something we will consider next semester. Uh, the reason, sir, as to why we chose the same airfoil for both was uh, just to help our manufacturability at this point. Uh, we have not considered that. Uh, we will consider it next semester, uh, but as for our kind of design thinking was that since the angle of incidence will be induced by the root rib, which is 3D printed, it wouldn't be difficult for us to do. Um, however, when we're laying up the carbon fiber, uh, we wanted kind of the most standardized process in order for us, in order for us to optimize our time and cost of the air vehicle. Uh, so we can't consider that, sir, uh, but as for why we chose the same Airfoil for both wings, uh, that is the reason behind it. Thank you very much. Just real yes, quickly on that same yes. note during your wind tunnel test. Yes, sir. If you really need to have that incidence angle in there, because think about the angle of attack of the, the horizontal tail or a surface behind, because you got downwash off of the first set of wings, it's going to give you a different angle of attack, and you may not need to have that incidence angle be different. In fact, you won't. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Dr. Adam. <laughs> <laughs> if, if I might add on uh, that, it's just typically conventional uh, with tandem wings. It's, if we don't need it, then we won't do it. Absolutely. You won't need it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Sounds good. You should give us the answers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any uh, further questions? Yeah, so uh, who's next? All right. Yes, sir. Cool. Um, so, uh, great job. That was, that was a lot of information. You guys covered quite a bit. And I really did appreciate uh, where you kind of went into how your, uh, some of your surfaces were sized. I, I really appreciate that. Um, do you guys have, uh, so I have a couple questions. Um, 33, uh, one of the risks that you talked about, I'll start with this one, was 30% uh, uh, delta on CLCD. Um, those were the two uh, parameters that you were worried about. Is there a reason why those are the parameters you're worried about, and why 30 percent? Why draw the line in the sand at 30 percent? I was wondering if I was missing something there. <laughs> yeah. um, well, 30 percent is just to be, um, you know, very conservative on both sides um, because the with the um, lift on that rear wing, we don't know exactly what that interference will be. Um, so if it turns out that it's like there's a lot of uh, interference on that rear wing and it's producing 30% less, uh, then the, the line in the sand was more or less uh, just to be conservative. Okay, so let me push that a little bit. So 29.5%, you're good. <laughs> no look, don't care. But 30.5%, it's a problem, according to the criteria. Yes, according to Katyan, but obviously when we look at it, something like that, right. 
we will definitely investigate yeah. with our wind tunnel testing. It all just depends with our calculations. Obviously, we've just been doing hand counts, but mm -hmm. when it comes to wind tunnel testing, everything might change. So Absolutely. So, kind, kind of the, thank you. So, so, kind of the lesson coming out of that, I think, is be careful with your, it, that's basically a test criteria or an evaluation criteria. Be careful about establishing arbitrary criteria because they're not, you can't substantiate it. Now, one thing that you might have been able to do is look at margin. And if you had a margin, you're like, okay, well, we can accept up to X, um, uh, you know, degradation in CL or whatever. Well, then you can actually put limits on it based on realistic kind of design constraints rather than just drawing lines in the sand. Thank so, you, sir. Yeah, we will consider it a little bit about that. Um, one question. Uh, what if your aircraft doesn't have to explode? Is there a way to bring it back to Earth? Yes, sir. Okay, so we also investigated, we've discussed um, this as per our RFP as well. The payload, have, there is a payload bay in the front bulkhead. Uh, would it help if I yeah, say the back? Yeah, no, All right, so there is a payload bay, which currently is holding the explosive payload of our aircraft. However, as per our business use case, this can also be applied for civilian applications as, uh, as you can see right here, uh, there's a large box for our three pound explosive, but depending on the actual application, whether it be for, which we haven't uh, developed too far yet as per business case, but. Uh, depending on its application, we can swap out that explosive and replace it with batteries, okay. testing equipment. No, that, that's awesome. Um, yes, one sir. question though for a military application. Yes, sir. Once you launch with an explosive, does it is it going to end in a explosion? No, sir. So as per our concept of operations, <laughs> sorry about this. Yeah, I, I was right before phase the, six was what bothered me. Oh, <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> sorry. Um, we meant, what we meant by this was that uh, in phase five, we can identify and confirm that the uh, target is a threat. Right. And that is the only time when the warhead will be armed. Oh, so are you, you asking about a recovery system, sir? Is that what you're yeah, asking about? Yeah, that's and tracking. <laughs> All right, um, so what we've kind of looked into that is a couple of things. Uh, some of the conventional ideas when you're not gonna put a landing gear or something like that is just catch it with a net. So there have been cases where people will catch these reusable drones or these, um, you know, not recoverable, the, the uh, idea is not to be recoverable, is you just catch it with a net, you come in at a, um, on your stall speed, and then you just throw up El Neto and you just catch it, so. Uh, okay. yes, sir. So we have investigated uh, those options. Um, the design also leaves room for variance yeah. for both, uh, depending on the application. Okay. Also with the net catch that we've looked into, the parts that are going to break potentially the vertical tails, you know, just stuff like that, all the most expensive stuff is inside the aircraft, so if it does crash and hits the net and kind of hits the ground, if the vertical tail breaks, that's only about $10 if that to just put on a new vertical tail versus all the onboard components which yep. cost upwards of $650 will be safe inside the aircraft. Yep. So just a suggestion on the kind of slide, maybe show two phase sixes. Um, Perfect, sir, yeah. One, one to include not exploding. Or to make it easy to say that the other guys are firing for dead. Right? Yes, sir. And normal. And normal. Yes, sir. Just two more notes for you. Um, <coughs> great job acknowledging on slide 30 that you didn't need a CG excursion plot. Uh, I was glad you mentioned that. Um, and then uh, leftover drag plot, uh, slide 21. Um, do you guys have actual plots um, that show kind of the lift curve and the drag curve so you can point out, you know, L over D max and some of those different, uh, you know, you can do the little tangent line from the origin and all kind of those classic techniques. Do you have that plot? We, we do, but we do not have them in the, the delivery. If you would like to see them, we can get your email yeah. afterward okay. and we will send them to you. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm good for emailing, but uh, my <laughs> suggestion is have plots have data to substantiate your claims yes, somewhere in your back pocket mm -hmm. so that uh, when you get challenged or when there are more in-depth questions that you can uh, present a little bit more data. Yeah, so great job. Sure. So backups. Uh, we do have an appendix available. However, I think we, we didn't include we, yeah, yeah. We, did, we did not include those graphs. So if I like that, um, 
graph. I'll get your email. I can send that to you. Real quick on the yes, sir. five, you have only 12.4 percent at this power. What are your thoughts on that? Just ask me. If you're not it. Would you like to elaborate? And how confident are you? Because you know, plus or minus 10 percent on the calculation. Uh, since we don't have our components, sir, yet, uh, we will next semester, and we will be doing some substantial testing, both statically um, and in the actual aircraft. That's going to be like scary for us. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, Do you think the power consumption yeah. for each component? On the risk. Yeah, I didn't see the whole risk split on the risk. It, it was no, not I'm just pointing out that, yeah, it's just. Yeah, we have we'll plenty consider of that as a major risk factor. That's more of a condensed list, but we, we have talked about it. And so once we get the parts, we will be doing more testing to see how we find this. Yeah, I mean, depending on if there's a headwind or anything that affects excess power, we go down. Yeah, no, 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 this is just like a PDR for the Yes, sir. Parts Thank you very much. <laughs> and um, with that, uh, you know, uh, we can mitigate that with uh, testing of multiple battery capacities and such uh, without too much change to the actual aircraft. Uh, another question. Yes, sir. Okay. Slide 26. Just type in the number. Oh, I'm sorry. Really? There you go, there you go, there you go. There you go. Yeah. Now, the uh, way you're calculating those things almost half, that just has to do with the aerodynamic loads, right? Yes, sir. We're going to snap and then like I said, what we're going to do. Just, <laughs> just pointing it out. Um, we were going to do finite element analysis as well as um, actual testing because that's very accessible for us as a 3D printed. Um, but that is definitely the, one of the first things we will test um, as we have these parts modeled and um, a few of us are gonna stay over summer, so we'll have the use of the RP lab. But you can get away with it real quick, like just really, you know, so. Oh, done, okay. Like Bending, yeah. Done because you, you, you've got a fixed displacement on the end, that's gonna be your interference. Correct, sir. Yeah, we can screw that or something like that. Uh, so the, <laughs> yeah, cool. Uh, we have not yet, but there is a, a there is a set. <laughs> yes, sir. Go ahead. Same calculation. <laughs> um, but yes, completely correct. We'll so go ahead and look into so that. Just be careful on the assembly because when you're sizing it for aerodynamic load, but you're going to put a huge displacement on the end of it and snap it in. Yes, sir. So you mentioned that it's going to be added. It's going to be printed. It's, yes, sir. Is that is that the plan for production as well, or is that just? Uh, for the, the prototype? Uh, just for the prototype, but consider, uh, considering how these are uh, shaped, they are definitely able to be uh, injection molded, sir. Okay. For, uh, for actual unit cost use. And our unit cost also, folks, was taken from uh, Goodlock's book as for unit cost um, with a 100 unit sale. Also, yes, that's a good point, though. One thing I would recommend is Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir, definitely. And we have considered that, um, you know, parts that are 3D printed uh, vertically sustain 30% of, a 30% reduction in strength in the Z direction if they were printed top down. So uh, most likely it will be printed on its side or at an angle for our prototypes. Also, Zane has delved into a lot of uh, acetone vapor, uh, acetone vapor smoothing, uh, which is you basically uh, like expose the 3D printed part to an acetone vapor bath, and the vapors will uh, sort of melt the outer outer layers. It uh, increases the toughness of the material by about 30 percent. By eliminating, how deep does that go? When you, uh, it's only the first two layers of the plastic. Yes, sir. But uh, <laughs> these parts were also considered with a 30 uh, percent infill. And that outer layer is pretty much holding that uh, structural part together. Uh, depending on our testing, we can always change that infill percentage. Uh, most likely, this will be 100% infill uh, printed at some type of angle, also using vapor smoothing uh, to mitigate that. Yes, sir. Real quick on 24, I didn't quite understand that margin. That's like an order of magnitude. I think there's a. When you're talking 100,000 psi, there's only a. Okay. That's ten. That's ten. Okay. Material rubber. That's material rubber. Five to one. Yeah. 
Any further questions? Yes, sir. So, your ABS plus that got uh, carbon fiber infused with it. Is that right? We did consider that. However, yeah, I thought I saw that on some of the other slides. Oh no, sir. Um, so maybe the cost side, sir. The that okay. actually. Sorry, you go to the end. Uh, we were considering normal ABS plastic. We did consider the carbon fiber reinforced ABS plastic. Okay. Uh, however, that's actually about uh, 15 to 20 percent more dense, uh, heavier than ABS due to those fine carbon fiber particles available in it. And uh, considering our weight um, and the sufficiency of normal ABS, uh, we s chose to stuck with ABS, uh, normal ABS for construction. Okay. Um, did you have something to add? Oh, sorry. Right. The uh, carbon fiber infused ABS also does have different material properties. Um, one being a little more brittle, as well as uh, being a lot more <coughs> So Just to clarify yes, my chart real quick, uh, it's kind of like two lines where it's like the wings, here's the carbon fiber, how much we'll need, and then the ABS, I understand how it could be read as yeah. carbon fiber ABS, but it's just, it's two separate lines. Yeah, so we should have separated so those, sir. So the carbon fiber is for the skin itself? The yes. skin, the fuselage body, which is a sandwich carbon fiber, uh, about one eighth inch thick, uh, between a honeycomb that is very flexible. We're gonna be working with um, uh, our AxFab uh, to manufacture that kind of monocoque tub for the fuselage. Uh, but it goes for the vertical tail plates, the fuselage, and the wing skins. Oh, sorry, and the sparks. All right. We have so, been uh, working with Greg back there, actually, in AxFab to go over some of the more uh, composite components that we can do to reduce weight and increase our strength on the uh, plastics. Yes, sir. Okay. So, in time you're dealing with plastics or composites, you're dealing with plastics. Yes, sir. Uh, you got to consider temperature and humidity, right? Don't look at You're going to see great numbers from the manufacturers. Don't believe them, all right? They lie. <laughs> so you got to put a reduction factor. Some Marine's going to have this on his back, crawling through some jungle somewhere. Yes, sir. It's going to get hot, it's going to get wet, and it's going to get weaker. So you got to uh, account for that in your chill process. Okay. So you put a, a knockdown factor there. Okay. Yeah. Which looks like you have plenty of margin. So you're yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. Yes, sir. But that 10,000, I think, is a, it's a pretty sporty number. Mm -hmm. when you consider the environment to the same that you put. Okay. Thank you very much for that for, input, sir. Yes, particularly sir. for additive, for additively made right. mm -hmm. yes. I, I think, yeah, my, my folks would, would get on me if I, if I was going to claim that kind yeah. of yeah. Yeah. strength. You never, from yeah, the yeah, yeah, seeds from manufacturers yeah. are just a story. We're going to throw out some comments for time as opposed to questions. Yes, sir. Um, you, you listed one of your risks as 30%. Typically, you want to use those as three sigma. So you can do more with tunnel data. You can bring down your perspective error bar, and that way your requirement never changes. Mm -hmm. It's just a great way of uh, looking at the risk. You have another risk, previous page 52. Um, you've already realized the risk of the aircraft being unstable in detail. It's already there. So now the question is, if you're taking off from a, a non-level surface, mm -hmm. make sure you've accounted for what that level can be, or does the Marine just throw it? It's 12 pounds, and he's in a firefight. Just throw the thing, get it the heck away that you want to be able to see. Um, yes, sir. In that environment, yes, sir. I'm not putting the air goggles on. Um, <laughs> 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 well, see, this is uh, this is this project was meant to uh, kind of step our infantry back from conflict and uh, possibly prevent that conflict from happening beforehand. Uh, so we took it, uh, we took the concept of operations kind of more in that note. Uh, however, I, I would understand how the VR goggle headset, excluding yourself from your surroundings um, while being uh, You may find a shot at with my name on it that will address the issue. <laughs> 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 I have, uh, my eyes, I'm sorry. And you talked about maximum altitude. I think in service ceiling, mm -hmm. 
So is your maximum cruise altitude truly your service ceiling? And, and so just make sure you get that correct uh, because there will be a lot of spaces of 9,500 feet that a Marine is at that they want this thing uh, that would work correctly. Understood, sir. Thank you very much. I have yes, one sir. last comment. Um, so I thought I saw something about an angle of attack limit of minus 10. And uh, that was at the start. A comment was made that the pilot would be in control of making sure that that angle of attack is exceeded. A pilot on the aircraft would have a hard time doing that, let alone on the ground. So I recommend an MCAS. Auto <laughs> I do recommend <laughs> making that automated, have a pilot take care of it, similar to Boeing's MCAS system, just do a better job. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. We will do that. And, um, you know, we, we allow for about 10 hours of training time per uh, operator uh, in order for them to gain. Um, experience with the aircraft, but we can definitely, we still definitely have room in the aircraft to allow for, uh, you know, uh, sorry, control uh, aids uh, electronically. There was a question in the back. The yes, sir. Just more comment than anything else. Um, first of all, that was outstanding. Um, Thank you have much. a dozen of those on down air traffic recovery missions in yeah, Afghanistan. Uh, it's nice to have an eye in the sky. You better have an eye in the sky that will blow them up. Yes, sir. Um, when you were looking at the uh, ABS versus carbon fiber ABS, um, did you pair back the carbon fiber ABS structure? My experience has been we actually save weight because it doesn't need to be as, as thick and heavy as its ABS brother. No, sir. Uh, we did not consider that because. Um, this was our initial design. We have a lot more room. If you can look at the bulkheads coming up on the slide, we have a lot more room for optimization in the entire structure of the aircraft. Right now we have simple, uh, you know, weight saving holes cut, stuff like that. But we wanted to essentially just cover all our bases, fitting our equipment in, uh, using a strong material may allow us after we do some finite element analysis and actual testing to optimize the design further, thus saving weight. I would, um, I would look at re-examining that further. And yeah, it's more expensive, but your primary customer here is Department of Defense and money go out there. Right? Definitely, sir. But it being a, it being a single use case, we thought that the competitors were um, you know, pretty costly for a thing that blows up and is used that was my opinion as well. Um, you, the last, last thing is the uh, whatever you've got currently scheduled for composite manufacturer on your IMS, mm -hmm. double it. Gosh, sir. Thank you very much for your input. Yes, sir. Make the, for, the fore wing and the aft wing identical. So if the aft wing has ports for your verticals to sit in, mm -hmm. put them on the front wing. That way, Marine can take whatever he has. Yes, has. sir. That uh, would actually run the Two less parts. Yes, sir. We'll take that into consideration. Thank you very much for your input. I have one. I, yes, sir. I have, I, um, <laughs> I have I have one thing. Um, so for the Chris kind of stole my question, but Sorry. for the um, for what happens if you don't have to detonate? So you kind of said, okay, we're giving thought to having a net capture, but this you, you're describing this as kind of a standoff weapon. So you got to the online site and you basically got a guy in the mission. You really don't want that falling into the wrong hands. Mm -hmm. um, from your mission flight power consumption, you were kind of running thin on margins, so just make sure you really think through what you're going to do with this thing. Because you're talking about urban combat. What if they all go hiding and you can't find anybody? How much time do you have? When do you know when to turn around? Make sure you give a lot of thought to knowing you can get back. Because the situation you described, the guys are going to have to move forward on the battlefield to get this thing. You don't want to leave the guy to the mission where you know, someone from ISIS can go grab it. I just they will understand. get personal in your hands. Would you suggest maybe a self destruction mechanism or something? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's it's where the current units have. That's it. Okay. okay. All right. We wanted to reduce the last one. We'll take that into consideration. Yeah. For, uh, after phase thank you very much all right i'd like to thank everyone for
chiming in on our presentation today. Um, and please, uh, panelists, uh, we provided you with some goodie bags. <laughs> uh, we will be here, or, sorry, our contact information is also located on the last slide of your presentation packets. But thank you very much, everyone.